this planet with close to 40,000 species of spiders, and today we're going to be talking about the 900 or so species uh, we all know as tarantulas. Many years ago, in the town of Toronto in southern Italy, people believed that if they were bitten by the European wolf spider, they would die, unless they did this wild dance to sweat out the venom. Um, and it's since become an Italian folk dance called the Tarantella. And uh, people came to the New World, they saw these massive hairy spiders, and uh, the name Tarantula was adopted to those spiders. And it sticks to this day. That's kind of long and short of the uh, story of how the Tarantula got its name. And uh, now many of us keep Tarantulas as pets. And some of you may be thinking, I wonder if I can breed these things. Well, my guest today is Joy Muggleston, and he is going to give us the basics on breeding tarantulas. It's a fun hobby. You can breed tarantulas, and uh, then you can have hundreds of baby tarantulas, or slings as we call them. Uh, you can keep them, you can sell them, you can give them away as presents at Christmas time. It'd actually be nice, you could uh, give all your family and friends baby tarantulas. Saves a lot of time with shopping. It'd be like the Oprah of tarantulas. All right. You're listening to the Edgar Ortega Radio Show. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. And you can follow this video to my channel and subscribe and uh, watch past interviews. Lots of great stuff on there. Also, like and follow my radio show page on Facebook and follow on Instagram. Recently, we had a uh, promotional contest sponsored by KenTheBugGuy.com, and one lucky listener won three Monocentropus balfouri slings, um, a really neato communal species of tarantula, and uh, our winner was Natalie Fritz. Congratulations to her. She has uh, received her prizes and uh, seems quite happy with them. So watch for more prizes and giveaways on the Edgar Tega Radio Show Facebook page. Everyone who subscribes here on YouTube is automatically entered into each giveaway. So subscribe, like, share, comment. And uh, for those of you wanting to learn the basics of tarantula breeding, let's go now to my interview with Joey Muggleston. All right, my guest is Joey Muggleston. He's been working with exotic animals for nearly three decades now. And he's produced numerous reptiles and an estimated 25,000 tarantulas, as he says. Uh, in 2014, he took his hobby a step further and opened the uh, Great Basin Serpentarium in uh, Utah. The company's focus is to provide education, captive propagation, and responsible uh, pet ownership. Uh, Joey, thanks so much for talking with me today. I'm looking forward to talk tarantulas with you. Well, thanks for having me. Um, now, I hear you recently, did you finish up a PhD, am I correct? Tell me about that. Yeah, last summer I finished up my PhD. I was looking at the evolution relationship of katydids and the evolution of their leaf-like wings. Well, that's really cool. So you're you're definitely in the uh, arthropod world, bugs, spiders, that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, um, as a... As a as a part of the plan of getting your PhD, you uh, you wanted to take your business to a new direction and add research as one of the goals. Talk to me about that. Well, yeah, now that I am done with the Katie did research, I wanted to start looking into some interesting questions that I think we can ask um, as as hobbyists. Basically, so we have all these animals here. We have all this data that we're collecting. But it just, for the most part, goes unnoticed. I mean, we keep it amongst ourselves. We serve with other hobbyists. But there's some interesting questions I think we can start asking about just little things like temperature-dependent sex determination or even sex ratios, things like that that we don't really know much about yet. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's col- the data collection you're talking about. We spoke with uh, Mark O'Shea recently, and he talked about uh, field herpers and hobbyists. Um, you know, noting any information they might uh, observe or anything uh, of interest, and to note it, write it down, and uh, do that sort of thing so that they can contribute to the knowledge of all the animals we have today. So it's good that even hobbyists can do that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And you're doing that now with, uh, with the Great Basin Serpentarium. That's cool. Uh, now we're here to talk specifically about tarantulas and tarantula breeding. So give us a background of your experience with exotic animals, and uh, then get into tarantulas, how you became interested in these animals, and catch us up to where you are today working with tarantulas. Okay, well, I got my start when I was quite a bit younger, so I think I was about six or seven when I got my first uh, reptiles. My family always kept exotic animals, so there were iguanas and anoles, things I've had around the house when I was younger. But I started keeping them myself at about six or seven years old, and early on, I remember my mom asking me, why would I just have one in a cage? Why not try getting a couple of them and see if we can get them to breed? And so that became kind of an interest early on. But I was actually arachnophobic up until my early teens. So at about 15 years old, I'd be out looking for snakes out in the desert. I'd walk into a spider web and my day was ruined. (laughs) And so I realized I had a bit of an irrational fear of spiders and I needed to get over it. So I went to the local pet store and purchased one of every tarantula that they had so I could just kind of jump in head first and learn about them because I figured once I learned about them, that fear would go away. And it kind of exploded from there. Within about a year, I was starting trying my hand at breeding them, and I've kept them since. Well, so after a year of keeping tarantulas, you went ahead and went, got into breeding them. Cool. <laughs> Did that help get over that um, that uh, nervousness I felt about them? Yeah, no, I had that same fear. I mean, and then I walked into a pet store I, and I started watching one. I think it was some type of zebra leg, mm-hmm. and uh, I just watched it. And then I ended up getting one, and that got me over the fear and everything. So that's really cool. A very similar story. Um, now, what's what species of tarantulas are you currently uh, working with for breeding? Oh, that's. It's a very, there's a long answer to that. We're currently working with more than, I think, at last count, we're at over 160 species of tarantula. Wow. And right now, I think we have about 70, 70 females that we're either, from 70 different species that we're either breeding right now, or we have males to pair them with. Wow, so you're certainly going to add to the numbers of, uh, of animals you're going to produce this season. That's really exciting. Do you have a favorite genus you like working with? Oh, that's a hard question because it typically is whichever one I'm looking at right at that moment. Yeah, this one's your favorite right now. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm really fond of Zenesis Amanis. It's the uh, Columbia Lesser Black. Uh-huh. It's a large South American tarantula. About, the records always say they get larger, but they get about seven, eight inches, dark black legs, and then they have this pink and black starburst pattern on their carapace. Oh, that's cool. A gorgeous yeah. tarantula. Very difficult to work with, to breed, but a beautiful tarantula. That's a specific species then. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a few within that genus, but they all look about the same. So. Oh, that's cool. All right, now let's get into the uh, breeding process. Uh, it's part of the show here. We talk to people with different backgrounds, different experiences, and so that we can learn from them. And you have quite a bit of experience working with tarantulas. I was actually directed to you from uh, Ken the Bug Guy and uh, Tracy mm-hmm. over there at KenTheBugGuy.com. So uh, they say you know your stuff, so uh, we'll go ahead and talk uh, tarantula breeding now, if that's okay with you. Sounds great. All right, um, let's get into the process. First things first, you need a sexual pair, obviously. Tarantulas, depending on the species, um, they'll vary on the amount of time it takes for them uh, to raise them up from slings uh, to adulthood. So talk to me about how long it takes, uh, (coughs) generally, for uh, you to raise a, a baby, a sling, up to adulthood. And then uh, talk about some of the different uh, variations in the species, because I know some take a lot longer than others. Oh, yes. So uh, that question is actually kind of a fun one, one we're kind of curious about, because again, we're just scratching the surface on our knowledge of these things. We don't know that much about tarantulas. But uh, the amount of time it takes to get them to their ultimate end start, their mature stage, is going to vary by species. And some species, like, uh, I guess some genera, like, Hoseletheria or Pteranochylus, it can be as early as 18 months and you can have that spider sexually mature. 
It can also take a lot longer, and that seems to be dependent on how often and how much you feed them and how warm you keep them. But in the more extreme end, you can have, you know, within 18 months, you can have a mature spider. Wow. Um, the more extreme on the other end, I have some spiders that are going on, let's see, I think I picked them up in 2008, and I think they're very mature this year. It's about two years to get them to that ultimate star. So it takes it takes quite a while on some species. And so I guess if you're going to get started, and the one thing to look at is how long that may take, and whether or not you want to buy spiderlings or looking to get in juveniles that already have a bit of a head start. Yeah. Of course, you pay a little more for the older ones. And oh, yeah. Especially if they're sex females, it'll cost you a little more. Exactly. Um, but it'll save you some time. Okay, so talk about sexing. Of course, you need a sexual pair. And our, ter- our tarantula is sexually dimorphic. I know it's uh, different with different species also, but uh, talk a bit about the differences in various male and female tarantulas. So the easiest way to sex them before they mature, once they mature, it's easy. The females um, look a lot like they did the molt before. The males, upon their ultimate and star molt, when they're mature males, the distal segment of their pedipalps, those little modified mouth parts that look like miniature legs, the end portion of those would be like little boxing gloves. And they use that to transfer the sperm packet to the females. So the mature male is easy to identify. Many species will also have tibial hooks on their first pair of walking legs. Um, previous to their ultimate molt, though, you have to look at other characters. And there's a lot of rumors out there that you can look at things like the thighs of the epithelioma, the abdomen. And or the or the relative length of the legs, but that doesn't seem to be too reliable. The, the main way to do this on almost every species is to look at the molt that cast exoskeleton, and on the inside you'll see this little um, sclerotized structure on a female, the spermethica. And if you see that, you know you have a female. If you don't see that, you either have a male or a female that destroyed her molt such that you can't see it. You can also look at the structure on the underside of males. They have what's called the epiandrous pufili. It's this group of specialized hairs that they use when they're constructing sperm web. And if you see that, you know you have a male. The problem is the soil type you use can cause the underside to look like you make it look like there's that epiandrous pufili there, but it's just because of standing from the soil or if the spider was rubbing its underside on something abrasive, you get a lot of false positives on that, basically. So the best way to tell is to look at that exoskeleton, look at the shed skin, and look for that spermethica. Right, and a lot of times um, there's forums and the groups available <coughs> where people will help you if they take pictures of the molt in the right place, so they can help you sex the spider as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot of forums that will do that, but be cautious because photos can be very deceiving. Right. And so... Take it with a grain of salt, and it's best to look at it in hand. Yeah, it's good to learn how to do that, and then you can just do it yourself. Um, oh, yeah. With a lot of the species, uh, the, the tibial hooks are pretty obvious, um, and of course they have that, females have that thicker body, and the males are, look pretty scraggly, especially like the Alfama pelma you'll find around here in the United States. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can, uh, t- it's side by side, I mean, you can tell, but other, other species, uh, more exotic stuff, it might be a little harder because they don't always have the tibial hooks. And yeah, so when they're mature, it's very easy on your local form of Alma. The males will typically go black with that gold color base, and females will be the typical, uh, or more typical, tan colored on the legs. But uh, they're only really dimorphic at that last molt. A male before he's mature is going to look just like a female. Mm. Yeah, yeah. All right, now we've raised up a male and a female. And how do you prepare these animals for breeding? And how do you, uh, how do you know when it's a good time to introduce the male to the female? So once the male is mature, you want your female to be pretty recent after a molt. If a female's gone six to eight months after a molt, we've noticed uh, the success rate drops. So we try to breed our females within within six months of the last molt. We try to get them paired. We've also noticed with males that males more than six months old don't produce. Either they don't produce fertile egg sacs, or the egg sacs are less fertile than the younger males. And so you notice fertility drops after about six months when you use these older males. So 
when everything's, uh, it's going to depend on the species. There's a lot of rumors of whether or not they're seasonal. A lot of the information we've gathered is showing that there is a bit of seasonality to these guys. And so something like brachypelma, one of the very common species in the hobby, we try to breed those. Usually the males mature at the end of summer. We try to breed them before December. And usually we get egg sacs by the end of January, um, early March. And so the males mature at the end of summer. The females will breed or will molt, sorry, usually early spring. And so the females are ready to go. Once those males have molted or mature, we just start pairing them at that point. We don't do any tricks with um, changing humidity or changing temperature. We just have a natural fluctuation of our facility that goes down a few degrees in the wintertime. Yeah. And that seems to be all the cycling that is necessary. All right. So it's pretty uh, typical with uh, with all the species you breed, there's not a lot of variation? Um, there's a little bit of variation between tropical and temperate species. Uh, our tropical ones tend to only breed during the warm months here. Okay. When I had them in a different building where we kept it warm year-round, we were hatching them year-round. So we do notice a slight pause when the building cools a few degrees, but the, the general process is the same, but it's just a fresh molt female, a male within six months, and make sure the conditions are the same conditions that the spider has during his breeding season in the wild. Well, that's very good. Okay, that's a good prep, prep uh, talk, uh, getting the animals ready and knowing when to put them together. Um, just like a lot of animals, you put them together, they're not necessarily going to do anything, especially if you work with snakes, you know that. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Okay, if, uh, so you've introduced the male to the female. Talk to me about what goes on between the two animals from there. Um, it isn't like birds or mammals mating, is it? Talk about the actual mating process of tarantulas. So the process is it's actually quite interesting because it seems to differ with each species just so slightly. So um, depending on the species, we will introduce them differently. So on some species, I'll just cut the male, I'll drop them right into the female's enclosure. And kind of the basic process is the male will start drumming. He'll get his pedipalps and sometimes also incorporate his first two pairs of walking legs, and he'll start drumming. And if the female's receptive, typically she'll start drumming back, and so they'll have this little uh, drum competition going back and forth. The male may also grab his third pair of walking legs and kind of uh, do these little tremors with those. And he's just shaking the bread, telling the female that he's out there ready to go. And if she's receptive, she typically exits her burrow. And then he will delicately, <laughs> so to speak, he will go and try to lift her up because he has the sperm packets with those pedipalps. So he gets first pair of walking legs, get around her calissary and start pushing her up and then reach underneath her with those pedipalps so he can insert the sperm packet in that uh, epigastric furrow. And so he's kind of lifting her up in this weird, weird little posture, reaching underneath her and trying to insert that sperm packet. But it's going to differ because that's, that's kind of your basic thing. Yeah. There are some species where if you drop the male in the female's cage like that, he's dead. She'll come out and grab him. Yeah. So some species, I'll put the male on a on a on like her cage lid to the side of her cage, and he'll drum and he'll actually coax her out of the cage to breed. And still others like the Pusilitheria, one of the most common genera kept in the hobby. I breed them on a wall. I don't breed them in the female's cage. If you breed them in her cage, your chance of losing the male goes up quite a bit. Mm. And so I'll, I'll find, uh, I'll take him against a wall. I'll put the male on the wall and, and open up the female's cage so he's right at the entrance of the cage. He'll drum and walk up backwards up that wall. And he'll coax the female out of her cage and they'll breed on the wall. And typically she runs back down into her cage and the male does this little manly strut off to the side. So, so you just put them up on your wall and breed them there, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've seen people, yes. yeah, I've seen people breed a Vicky Larry on their hands, so I guess that's not so weird. Um, oh. Now, now that's cool. Uh, now, is this a one-time thing, or do you introduce the male back in multiple times? Do you have multiple males, or is that it? Is it a one-time thing? One time is all it takes, it seems. Um, we do typically try to do multiple parents per female, but um, often we'll have multiple females ready to go at a time, and so the male will just kind of go through the ranks, and if he makes it long enough, he'll come back to the first female. I try to do multiple pairings, but we have enough data to show that it only takes one good insertion for it to work. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, a lot of times people will raise up, you know, they got a male and a female, they, they're excited about it, and then they introduce the male to the female, and there there goes the male. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so we're breeding them. We actually... 
I have a lot of pictures of it. It's not just because I like taking pictures of it, but it's also because I'm sitting there the entire time. And just out of the frame of all the shots that I take, I'm sitting there with a ruler in my hand, which we coined the magical mail saving stick and a deli cup ready to cut the mail. If anything looks off whatsoever, we, we grab them out of there and try again a different day. Yeah. It's not like with snakes, you put the mail in there and then walk away. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I mean, it's, I like it's, it's pretty quick too, isn't it? It can be. Um, oddly enough, the dwarf tarantulas, the Syracosmus, which max out, the largest ones are about two inches. Most of them are about an inch or so. They will stay locked up for over three hours. We we plucked one at about four and a half hours. Wow. Either about two and a half, three hours. Others, it can be within seconds. There are times that I miss the shot because I can't hit the shutter fast enough. <laughs> and it's all done and he's ran off and she's back down at her burrow. Yeah. Maybe because you're watching, who knows? <laughs> yeah. now, now, you've acquired a pair, you've raised the slings up to adulthood, you've bred them, you put them together. What happens next? Does your female uh, start blowing up with eggs? What happens next? <laughs> this is where the being patient aspect of the hobby comes into play. I guess raising them up for 10 years also. But uh, yeah. once they breed anywhere from three to six months on most species, if you kept, keep them warm and humid, uh, warm and humid enough, I guess, for the each requirements for each species. But um, usually three to six months later, you'll notice the female getting larger. Now, where a lot of people mess up is they think that they need to heavily feed the females, and they get them obese. They get them so obese that the females will actually molt and not produce eggs. But if you keep her at a healthy weight, typically within three to six months on most species, they'll start swelling up, and they'll produce an egg sac, ideally. All right, right. So you said about you know, six months, you said? Within six months, most species are. There are some, like Prosolitheria metallica, one of those really common blue um, blue tiger spiders. Yeah. The uh, gooey sapphire ornament, I think, is a common name for those. They they can take up to nine nine to ten months. They're a little bit unusual. They, they take a bit longer than most. But in most cases, if I don't see an egg sac within six months, I figure that it's not going to go this year and we'll try again next year. All right, all right. And you said... Uh... Not to feed them too heavily then, because what happens if she molts? I mean, why, what, what's the bad thing about that? So that little structure that you look for when they molt that spermethica, that holds on to those spermatophores, those sperm packets the male has. And when the female sheds, she sheds the line into that spermethica, which also means she's shedding any chance you had at a successful egg sac. So once she sheds, all that sperm is gone, and you need to breed them again. Yeah, so it's not she's not going to produce if she, if she yeah. uh, molts in that time. That's one of the reasons you wait for them. Uh, when, when you talked about timing when you breed them, and uh, and you want to make sure you get that going. Um, now she forms her egg sac. Do you leave it in with her? Do you take it away? And uh, what do you do with it? Uh, that differs on each hobbyist. Personally, I like taking them as early as I can because I like gathering the data on how long it takes for them to go through the different developmental stages in the egg sac. So I pull them pretty early, but these spiders have been doing this a very long time without our help. They're really good moms. And so you could actually leave that egg sac in there the entire time and wait until the spiderlings are ready to go, wait until they're that second instar stage, and then pull them at that point. And we've done that sometimes. Sometimes I'll forget that there was an egg sac in there and I'll look in one day and see a whole bunch of baby spiders. But typically, I pull the egg sacs anywhere between 5 and 21 days, depending on the species, so that I can, I can monitor the development and record the development. Right, right. Now, um, how long until you have baby tarantulas running around? Talk about the instar process, and uh, do you help them out of the sac, or do you just wait till they all come out? How does that work? It's really up to you how you want to do that. They come out on their own. And so, on a lot of the egg sacs, we'll pull them out. We'll cut them open and, you know, uh, document what stage they're at. With some species, within 9 or 10 days, they come out as little eggs. So there's a bunch of eggs and goop that goes in that egg sac. And the eggs absorb most of that goop that's in there. And they look like this little, tiny little yellow grape sitting in the egg sac. And then they shed the corian, the outer lining of that egg. And once they shed the corian, they release the post in real stage, or we call it eggs and eggs in the hobby. And they look like two little grape with little legs on it that's waving at everything. Uh-huh. And so they'll kind of wave their little legs. And then anywhere from seven to, I think, about 30 days later, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to differ a lot based on temperature and species, but it could be just a couple of weeks later, it could be over a month later, you end up with a first 10 star. So there's little eggs with legs. 
will go to the first molt, and that's the first instar molt, followed by the first instar stage. And at this point, they don't quite look like tarantulas yet, but they are, they'll flip over, they'll walk around. They don't eat as first instars. At the previous stage, at the exit leg stage, they can flip over sometimes and they'll eat a sibling and they'll drink. But at the first instar stage, they, are, they stop eating, typically. And then there'll be first instars anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. So your brachypelma, agamphoscoria, some of these larger South and Central American species, they can take up to three months to hit the second instar stage. But they will molt. They'll reach second instar stage, and at that point, they look like little miniature tarantulas. For most species. Again, there's a couple exceptions to that. But for most species, it's anywhere from like 30 days to 90 to 120 days to go from egg to second instar. And they're coming out of the sack by then? Usually they come out around first instar. So if you don't cut it open, at the first instar stage, they make their way out of the egg sack. And they usually, if they're in with mom, they hang around the egg sack, hang around a mom's web up until the time they hit that second instar molt. Um, but yeah, at, at usually the first instar stage is when they break out of the egg sac. Right. Now, um, one of the benefits to taking the sac, of course, would be managing to catch all those little... <laughs> All the little, all yes. the little spiders, because you got to put them in individually, usually with most species. Uh, how do you go about catching all the little guys? So, if we leave them in with mom. Well, how many? Do you, how many does she produce? First of all, just so we have an idea of the numbers. Um, our egg sacs will range from. I guess you can have an egg sac with just one in there if you have a really unlucky egg sac, but typically they range from all the smaller species or like Irtacuma, um, no, sorry, Idiophilia mira. You get about 15 to 25 babies per egg sac. Um, Monocentropus is about 4 or 8, also about 15 to 38 babies per egg sac. But some things like uh, Acanthus Korea and Lapsiodora, we've had over a thousand spiders in an egg sac. Yeah. And so if you leave it with mom, usually when there's a big egg sac, I watch them carefully because I don't want to have to try to catch a thousand spiders out of a cage. But um, if you leave it with mom, it becomes quite an ordeal. We usually just get the cage, put it inside a larger bin so that when they run, we can catch them. And you sit them with a whole bunch of miles just collecting one at a time. Put on a movie or something because it's going to take a while. Yeah, you don't want to chase around the uh, Lassiodora parahybana with the mom around, and there's thousands of them. In the yeah, thousands. mom usually is pretty cantankerous when you're trying to take egg sacs or trying to dig babies out of a cage, so... Yeah, yeah. It's a fun process. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, you could have just a few in the eggs... And then you could have, you know, a thousand in the eggs. So that's, that's quite a thing to manage. But how do you go about, uh, you just go about, put them in a little vial or something? What do you do with the babies? How do you individually uh, catch them and house them? Yeah, usually so when we put them in our incubators, they're in these smaller containers. So they're fairly well contained. But um, when it comes time to count them, we put that smaller container in a larger bin so they can't climb out. We open up the lid and then... Like I said, just sit there with about a thousand little vials with a little bit of soil and uh, a little bit of damp soil in there. And just one at a time, you collect each baby and put it in the vial. And it is quite a time consuming process. Yeah, but yeah, just one, one, it's all individual things. Just one at a time, hoping they don't get out too and trying yep. to keep an eye on all of them. Yeah, it's an interesting, fun little process. Now, have you found uh, some species more challenging to breed than others? Uh, are old, old world species more difficult New world than new world species? There's each one is slightly different, and the difficulty is going to be either with pairing, finding out the little tricks to getting the male to pair successfully, or getting them on the same molt cycle. But um, in terms of breeding, yeah, there are some species that are simple. So and it's kind of this uh, ironic twist of fate with this thing because you have your your best pet species like your Gramostola, your Brachypelmas. Those are really difficult to breed, whereas the ones that are probably best reserved for someone with more intermediate experience, like your horn baboon, Cerdogyrus, or your um, starburst baboons, Ternochylus, those things breed like rabbits. They look at each other and they produce egg sacs. Uh -huh. But uh, they're a little bit more aggressive, they're a little bit faster moving, so they're not the best for the beginner hobbyist. But, but uh, there are definitely some species that are much easier to breed than others. Oh, that's really cool, and uh, you continue to breed them, you plan on continuing to breed them, gather data and your research. Tell me mm -hmm. about, uh, no, I appreciate you talking to me, you basically gave us, you basically gave us the basics of tarantula breeding, uh, so that's really cool uh, that you could put that out there. Uh, where can people learn more about Great Basin Serpentarium? Tell me about the Serpentarium before we go here. 
so what we're doing here, we were a lot more involved with the hobby until recently, but we were producing, we are just working on getting captive bred animals out there. We just see that the best step for the hobby to preserve itself as a hobby moves forward is to focus more on the propagation efforts and to educate not only those within the hobby, but those outside the hobby. And that's what we were really focused on doing for the last few years. Um, as we shift now, what we want to do is we're continuing to work on type of propagation, but we're working with some of the less common species. So um, to, to continue with the spiders, of course, but also we're working with some rare lizards, some vronids that aren't commonly kept, some pythons that aren't commonly bred in captivity. But um, kind of tying the whole education aspect in with also pulling in some research aspect as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. To learn more about it, we have a website. We're currently revamping it. And so a lot of the data that we've been collecting, we're putting up on the website. So hopefully in the next month or two, we'll have all that available to the public. So you can go to the website, see our records on the Python, see our records on the spiders, and kind of get ideas of how we do it. <clears throat> right. And some people will hear this uh, by the time the website's up. So what's the website? Um, where can they go? Uh, GBSerpentarium.com gbserpentarium.com. You guys are on Facebook as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Joey Muggleston, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to talk about tarantula breeding with me. I know people uh, interested in getting into tarantula breeding uh, learned a lot by listening to you. Um, thanks for, for doing that. Uh, we appreciate you uh, talking to me here. Right, thanks for having me. Hope we can talk some other time. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Joey. That was Joey Muggleston talking to us about breeding tarantulas that was lots of fun please remember to subscribe to my youtube channel edgar ortega one word and uh, follow me on instagram and the radio show page on facebook if you have anything you want to talk about you can get a hold of me there you've been listening to the edgar ortega radio show please remember to subscribe to my channel on youtube and uh, continue listening. Watch for my other shows, and uh, you can search through uh, my channel and see my past interviews. Thanks again for listening to the Edgar Ortega Radio Show.